See, the sins that are listed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and Galatians 9, 5, 19 through 21, and Ephesians 5, uh, verse 4 through 7, that disqualify people from the kingdom, well, they can't apply to the believer. See, that, that, that can no longer apply. That's the reason they don't get it when we tell them they got to stop sinning. Because everything they're taught is telling them they can't stop sinning, and it doesn't matter if they don't. They can still receive Jesus, and then maybe someday he'll, he'll help them stop even though that's not the case, because they never, they never stop their... All they do is enter into a sin-repent, sin-repent thing. And most of them get so hardened, they just fall by the wayside. They don't do anything. See, simplistically, is what I'm trying to do here, is summarize everything that they preach, and they teach, and they disseminate in the professing system over the last 1,500 years. This is the way the gospel's been presented to the world, for the most part. And portions of this false theology and fallacies still affect almost everyone, even that come out of the system, to some degree, because they've been in contact with these teachings of past and present pundits that they like some of the things that they said. So they retain that, these fallacies and they weave them into their, their present preaching. That's what the street preachers have been doing for the most part. I haven't, found, I haven't found one. I haven't been able to click one up yet that's really telling the people that they've got to come clean with God. Because why? Because they, somehow they've weaved in this, this moral corruption and this moral transfer thing, and you can't do anything right with their teaching. That's why. So instead of simply telling people to obey God, do what he said, with your unhindered free will and ability to do so, go and sin no more, within this theology then they find a way to go on in sinning and not suffer the consequences of reaping what you sow. Like we see in, in, in all their excuses and all the stuff they write on the blogs. So therefore, you can sin and not die. You can commit the sins that will said to disqualify you from the kingdom, you can commit them either occasionally or continually. It doesn't make any difference. If you commit them, you commit them. And you cannot die. Why is that? Well, because you're born in sin. You're depraved. You've got limited ability and free will because God's made a provision for you as an alternative to keeping his commandments, which you couldn't keep to begin with. Because salvation is a free gift that's not of works. It's by faith alone and trusting in the finished work of Christ. His wrath's been satisfied in Christ, and Christ exchanged places with you on the cross. He became sin in your place, and he took your punishment, and, and that's what people are told. And because the moral transfer then has taken place, his virtue has been transferred to you, so his obedience and his perfect righteousness serves as your o obedience, with lack of obedience, and your lack of any righteousness whatsoever because you're filthy rags and wretched man. So that's, that's, a, that's a real good reason why you can sin and not die. And because, of course, your sins then are removed, uh, covered, past, present, and future, remembered no more against you, east is from the west, all, all that stuff. It's, it's nothing talked about your previous sins are committed. It, doesn't, it never talks about if you sin willfully against your knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice remains. No, they don't talk about that. They just talk about it's done deal, finished work, because you can't do anything. And so it all boils down to then nobody's perfect, nobody's righteous, everybody remains wretched to the core as a Christian. As a professed Christian, you're a carnal Christian, you're carnal sold under sin. Romans 7 teaches that man has got this nature within him, this corruption in his flesh, this weakness in his will. Well, his weakness in his will is from the process of growth of practicing sin. Giving himself over to the slavery of sin, selling himself for nothing, like Isaiah put it. And then through that process, that progression of reprobation, made himself into that position where he's depraved and has a debased mind. Yes, that's difficult to come out of, but he wasn't automatically in that position to begin with. No, it's a matter of growth, physis. The word nature in Scripture is physis, the principle of growth, the nature of growth, growth and development of something. So that's the progression that Paul shows in Romans chapter 1 that we pointed out. So basically then, all these pundits, past, present, theologians, PhDs, preachers, pastors, popes, bishops, 
you name it, reformers, all the reformers that a lot of these street preachers seem to love and cherish, all, all their works, even though that was laced with all this, this false theology and fallacy. No matter what it's, what happens, what's said, no matter how simple we can put it about doing what's right in Christ, then you can rest assured that they're all correct and anybody that says otherwise, that you've got to stop sinning and obey Christ to enter the kingdom, well, they're the devil incarnate and they've sent, been sent to terrorize the church and they have to be expelled and exposed for mean monsters full of hate and judge because no sin is going to disqualify you from the kingdom. No. No, because you're, you can't do it and if you try to do it, you're going to save yourself. So you're constantly cautioned, don't do it. So it's just like telling a kid to do what's right and then telling him he can't do it at the same time. That's basically the theology. Like I said, the summary of this theology is taking away the man's ability to do what's right in God's sight because of some malady, because of some corruption, lack of willingness. Well, your only lack of willingness is because you won't turn from your sin. You've sold yourself into drug addiction, sexual perversions, all these other perversions. Now you're entrenched in those things. So the, prog the progression that took you into it reverse that into a progression of godly sorrow, repentance, and brokenness to bring you out of it. That's what it's going to take. You can't just receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit's going to come in and make all, everything right. That's not how it works. There's a season of godly sorrow, a crisis of conviction that takes place that may take weeks, months, even years I've seen it in, in individuals that come through this. But finally coming through it with the understanding that you've been cleansed, purged, and purified in Christ. That's what the scriptures show in a self-cleansing humility and brokenness. So the progression that took you into your depravity, reverse that into a progression to bring you out of it through repentance. And quit listening to these people that tell you you can't do it, and that magically God's going to help you. He is helping you by convicting you. If you still have a conscience that shows you and tells you these things are wrong, they're ruinous to your soul, that's God convicting you. The conscience, the moral conscience He placed into you. You have a moral conscience and natural passions and desires. You've corrupted those passions and desires through the progression of sin, selling yourself into slavery. You've got to give yourself back over to seeking God, diligently seeking Him out through that process of repentance and brokenness. That's the Psalms. That's the Psalms David's talking about. He wasn't justified in his sins like your pastors and your missions are telling you out there. No. He was broken and contrite before God, emptied himself of guile. Read the Psalm 32 and 51 and get that stuff out of your head that God's got to, got to do everything for you when you're a worker together with God. So you are being deceived by these empty words, just like it says in the scriptures. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or homosexuals, or sodomites, thieves, and covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, or extortioners, they're going to inherit the kingdom. Why? Because God hates, and, yeah, God hates sin, of course. How could you allow that into the kingdom? The people have got to be purged of those things or they're forever going to be corrupt with their ulterior motive to take advantage of someone. So do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you with empty words, he said in Ephesians 5. That was 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, by the way. Ephesians 5, verses 6 and 7, let no one deceive you with empty words. That's what these are, empty words that profit you nothing and make you worthless. Like the prophet said, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, and then partake of their wrath of God. See, the wrath's not been satisfied in Christ. There was no wrath poured out on Christ. That's a lie. That's a fallacy. That's theology. There's wrath yet to come on the children of disobedience. What? Who obey not the gospel, right? 1 Peter 4, 17. 
What will the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Well, the gospel is to believe on Jesus Christ. And now, so you'll believe and obey Jesus Christ. That's what Peter said. That's what Jesus said. It's one and the same thing. And then in, the, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, he, he disseminates the, the works of the flesh are evident, adultery and fornication, uncleanness and lewdness, idolatry and sorcery and hatred, contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and heresies and murder and envy and drunkenness.